Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Balls in Your Face Marketing. Today we are discussing the fall of Rome. And I am joined by my favorite doctors of philosophy and founders of the Petrarch Institute, Dr. Miles Smith and Dr. Alexander Rosenthal Pabul. So let me set the stage a little. Um, I have observed, and I am by no means the first, uh, that there are uh, certain parallels between what I know of the fall of Rome and the current modern era. Uh, I'll, I'll list a few that I just kind of pulled from history.com, uh, the economic uh, troubles and an over-reliance on slave labor, the rise of the Eastern Empire, uh, an over-expansion and military overspending, government corruption and political instability, the loss of traditional values. So it begs, for me, it begs the question, could the fall of Rome have been prevented, had the Romans been able to read about it beforehand, um, and what could have been done to prevent it? So with an eye uh, on towards the uh, modern Western civilization, what happened? Yeah, well, of course, it's a question that has been asked many times before in history, perhaps most famously by uh, Edward Gibbon in his classic text, The Decline and Fall uh, of the Roman Empire. I think one of the reasons why it is a topic of fascination for us is because the Romans in many ways were a civilization quite a bit like our own. In fact, in the case of the United States, it was quite consciously modeled after the Roman Republic. You had a sophisticated economy with uh, international trade based around international trade, a highly uh, sophisticated civil administration, uh, municipal schools, um, uh, and, uh, you know, an advanced culture in the arts and letters and all this uh, uh, sort of thing. And then uh, we start seeing, particularly in the third century, uh, sort of the breakdown uh, of this world. And I think it's sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, there's a quote from the fourth century, Ammianus Marcellinus, he wrote that the libraries are closing forever like tombs. Just imagine cities emptying out the economy collapsing and returning to a barter system, people no longer using money, a system of, of trade that united the Roman Empire along the Roman roads collapses, the roads are covered over, uh, and uh, you know, this whole, uh, and, and the economy turns local. As people leave cities, they go into the countryside uh, to, the, uh, to, to sell their labor, as it were, to the great landowners, right? And, and, and you have the development of these local economies, which is really the basis of the Middle Ages. So, so I think that one of the reasons it fascinates us is because you have a society uh, very much like our own. Um, we have the idea of progress, that things should get better and better, right? Mm -hmm. With each passing decade, we kind of have this in our head. But I think that there's this other voice that looks back on the fall of Rome and thinks, could it happen to us? Could our civilization uh, decline can, uh, can, uh, and civilizations uh, fall? So I think that's why it's um, exerted an enduring fascination. Uh, as far as why, it's why it exactly it happened, there have been um, a wide variety of theories, of course. Um, someone like Spengler thought of the rise and fall of civilizations like a life cycle. You know, civilizations are born and sort of in a deterministic way, uh, they collapse, um, you know, at a certain point. They live, you know, they're born, they live, they prosper, and then they die, right, uh, in a very organic model. Um, others have emphasized the economic uh, and the political. There has been, we just recently did a video not long ago emphasizing sort of the, the biological and climatological things that were going on. You know, there was a massive plague during this third, this third century crisis that possibly killed millions of people and contributed to the depopulation of uh, cities. Um, and all, all of, um, all of, you know, all of these theories are kind of interesting and have made their contributions uh, to what occurred. Um, but it's interesting to me that among the Romans themselves, the um, the, they did not think of it as a deterministic, necessary process. They wrote themselves about their own process, what they saw as the process of decline, and they attributed it principally to the realm of uh, mores. 
some have argued, we are Roman, right? That's a phrase used by the syncretic thinker, Remy Brog. And I think he was mostly talking about Europe, but the, the, the point is, uh, you know, those, those um, the permeance of that identity is extremely broad and extremely long lasting. So it's not only that Rome is in and of itself so interesting, it interests us because of affinities that we ourselves very easily and very often forget, or they're so subtle and oblique that you have to kind of examine yourself from 90 degree angle to see them. You almost need a little bit of background in classical uh, antiquity, let's say to decode Washington, D.C., <laughs> right? Yeah. And there you have on Capitol Hill, Senate, <laughs> right? Uh, mm -hmm. Deliberating in a republic where John Adams used to carry Cicero, Cicero around with him wherever he went. I mean, the founding fathers very consciously were building a new Rome the new world, right? And then you look at all the neo-Roman classical architecture everywhere. Uh, you just realize the long shadow that this civilization has cast uh, everywhere that Western civilization exists pretty much. Well, I'm reminded, hearing what you were both just talking about, you know, I'm reminded of a quote, and I don't know who to attribute to, you may, you may, which is, you know, you know if, even if history does not repeat itself, it certainly rhymes. I was thinking, you know, when we talk about the fall of Rome, and Alex, you addressed this, uh, in talking about some of their strengths, you know, the, the question that presents itself is, what did Rome fall from, right? What was its height and what was the basis of its strength? Why is it looked at as a model? I'm not a historian, so I always tend to like the sort of the maximum sim, uh, simplifying and synthesizing principles that you can apply. And the two things I kind of think of across its history as it transitions uh, from republic to, to empire is, you know, republican virtue first and then imperial competence. So the two things that are really striking are um, this emphasis on uh, a kind of robust, um, stoical, um, austere, courageous, and implacable, um, almost agrarian-based virtue, which is the kind of Republican building block. And then they get very good at administrative arts. They're very good as military campaigners. They're very good as engineers. They're very good at logistics, you know, giant maps on walls, rooms where they know all the movement of people through the ways and the management of huge supplies of grain. So, you know, that's sort of what they possessed at a certain point. And the question is, why is that eroded at, at a certain point? And you mentioned the kind of um, uh, dichotomy in historical uh, accounts where people tend to favor either um, a fall away from something human active in principle that was done. And then when it's not done, always present adverse forces like the ocean roll in or is it something that's material and adventitious so something comes along like a virus or a new enemy on a certain uh a frontier or some kind of um uh mechanical analyzable force that undermines the vitality of the state and there's and it's it's interesting because that's that's a kind of uh rival interpretive lens issue in history and it's really interesting when you apply it to Rome because Rome is a good uh, case study for both both historical categories in a way right the the idea that decline is a choice is very richly rewarded if you look at, at Rome because they, they start off with a kind of model of virtue that's, that's you know much discussed and at the same time anyone who's interested in any of the material causal factors of history can go has centuries huge terrain and an ample variety of different kind of incidents and factors. One thing that I thought was interesting, as I say, not being historian, but what, what struck me when I learned it was in later Rome, you see two things in, in, in parallel that you might not necessarily expect, which is corruption and increasing wealth. So there's a period of time in which revenues are actually going up, but in some ways the fabric of the empire is weakening because there's so much corruption uh, in, in various forms, distributed at different levels of society and across the empire. So, you, you know, you, not all the vital signs are going in the same way at the same time. As is often said, you know, to know where you're going, uh, it's important to know where you've been. I think the, the study of history in these subjects is um, exceptionally important. Um, so I encourage people to go and check out the Petrarch Institute. Um, I will put links above and below. And as I said, uh, they are now on uh, Udemy. Um, so you can go and sign up for courses there and uh, learn about classical antiquity. So gentlemen, thank you so, so much. Thank, thank you, Julian. It was a pleasure.